Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Exodus, reading chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Listen to God's word. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have given heed to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. The word of the Lord. Well, it was one of those moments when everything changed, almost in an instant. Moses had had those moments before in his life. One of them happened when he was just a baby, born into a place and a time when his people, the people of Israel, were slaves in Egypt. The pattern of a young Hebrew baby's life seemed set. Grow up and work for the Pharaoh. Endless, back-breaking work. But at least it was predictable. That's what his life would be. But on an otherwise ordinary day, the Pharaoh issued a decree that all Hebrew boys be killed. And so his mother hid baby Moses as best she could. And she placed him in a basket and she floated him down the Nile River. And he was drawn up out of the river by the daughter of Pharaoh. In an instant, the course of his whole life changed. From an enslaved Hebrew child in danger to the palace of Pharaoh, raised as a prince of Egypt. And then again, as an adult, it all changed again in an instant. On an otherwise ordinary day, the prince of Egypt saw a Hebrew slave being mistreated by an Egyptian, and he reacted out of a sense of justice, and the Egyptian died. And in an instant, 
the prince of Egypt became a fugitive. How far was it from the palace to the prison? Moses didn't hang around to find out. He ran away across the desert and became a shepherd in Midian. Years passed. Moses married, had children, he tended his sheep, and the course of his life had settled into a predictable rhythm again. And then, on an otherwise ordinary day, he noticed something strange. It was all about to change again. We've all had those moments. Some of them you can see coming from a long way off. You, you stand at a crossroads and you know that the decision that you are about to make will have lasting consequences. Do you choose that school or that job or that person and what will that mean long term? Or the phone rings with news you never expected. And you know, even before you hang up, that nothing will be the same after you do. Other moments can sneak up on you. You can only see them after they happen, or maybe even years later. You realize your life took a direction and you had just barely leaned that way. And you hardly noticed at the time. I think if Moses, late in his life, ever went to a life coach or maybe a team-building training session with other leaders of Israel and they asked him to draw the journey of his life, it would be a roundabout squiggly line that covered the whole page and then was interrupted by these huge starred events from Egypt to Midian and back to Egypt and then this long journey in the wilderness that we're going to hear about in the coming weeks. And one of those huge starred events would have to be this encounter with God on the mountain. Rabbi Mark Gelman in his book, Does God Have a Big Toe, has a story about this story of Moses. It's it's Midrash, it's a type of Jewish story that's written about a biblical story and helps interpret it. And Gelman tells how God came to pick the person who would lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. God knew that that person had to be somebody who wouldn't give up, no matter how long it took or how much the people complained or how bad things looked, the people needed a leader who was patient. So Gelman says, God set out to make a patience test to find the right person for the job. The angels tried to help. Gabriel brought a tangled ball of string and said, whoever has the patience to untangle this ball of string, God, is our person for sure. But God thought that untying knots was kind of boring and this would not be a boring job. Then the archangel Michael brought God a puzzle cube that looked a lot like a Rubik's cube, which hadn't even been invented yet, and said, God, this is a great patience test. But God thought it really took more persistence than patience to solve a puzzle like that. And God was convinced that some of the worst leaders had the most persistence. So... Gelman says God created the burning bush, which turned out to be the very best patience test of all. In the story, a few shepherds pass by the burning bush, but they don't stay very long. A bush in the desert's pretty ordinary. Even a burning bush in the desert isn't that big a deal, Gelman says. So nobody took the time to sit long enough to watch the miracle happen. But Moses did. And he watched and watched and he saw that the bush's leaves were burned and that the bush's branches were black, just like an ordinary burning bush. The only thing different about this burning bush was that it did not burn up. It just continued to burn and burn and the branches never fell down in a heap and the fire never went out. It took a while to see all that. Moses tried to get the other shepherds to stop and watch, but they were too busy. 
He was the only one who waited long enough to notice. Another rabbi, Lawrence Kushner, says this, The burning bush wasn't really a miracle. It was a test. God wanted to find out whether or not Moses could pay attention to something for more than a few minutes. When Moses did, God spoke. The trick is to pay attention to what is going on around you long enough to behold the miracle without falling asleep. There is another world right here within this one whenever we pay attention. So Moses turns aside. He watches and he waits long enough to see that something extraordinary is happening. And then into that space of miracle, God speaks and calls him into service. God says, Moses, I am God, the God of your ancestors, and I know that my people are suffering in Egypt. I've seen them and I've heard them and I have a good future for them. So I'm sending you back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Lots of us wish that God would speak to us in such a clear way. Surely, we think, it would be easier to listen if bushes would just burst into flame near us and if God would speak out loud like that with a clear mission. What I love about Moses is the same thing I love about these other family ancestors we've been hearing about in Genesis. They are so very human, like us. Moses got a burning bush, got the voice of God, got holy ground, all of that, but still says, um, hang on, God. I have got some questions about this mission ahead, which actually sounds pretty dangerous. Who am I to do this? And who exactly are you? And what should I tell the people when they ask me on whose orders I say this crazy thing? And God, who is even more patient than Moses, answers every question. God offers Moses some helpful tools, a hard-to-translate name for God, some promises of signs and wonders, and later on, after even more questions, he gives Moses this pretty miraculous staff to use and a brother who can help Moses do the talking. But it was something else, God said, that got Moses back down the mountain signed on to God's crazy mission. The most amazing promise. You can do this, Moses. I will be with you, God says. I will be with you. Is there another promise that we need more than that one? It was enough for Moses. He did indeed go back to free the people. He patiently waited out Pharaoh's stubbornness. He held on through some terrible things, trusting that God was with him. He led the people toward the promised land, trusting in God, and it took years and years. And Moses almost lost it out there in the wilderness a couple of times. And that line of Moses' journey on the page just kept winding around and around. But this time, something was different. After the burning bush, Wherever his journey led, Moses knew he was not alone. I thought about Moses a little bit last week while I was waiting on the eclipse to happen. My family nerded out and got all caught up in the excitement and we drove down to South Carolina to the path of totality. We were as overprepared as we could be. We had sunscreen and water and a couple of possible routes to take if the traffic got bad. We had packed a picnic lunch and my husband's camera gear and our certified solar glasses and our beach chairs. There was absolutely nothing spontaneous about it. <laughs> we knew exactly what time it was going to happen and where we needed to be for 100% totality and exactly how long it would last. And through the wonders of science, we knew how to witness it safely and even capture photos and beam them to our friends and family across the world. And it was truly spectacular, almost indescribable. 
One of those moments when I felt unbearably small compared to this vast universe that God has created. I was surprised to find tears in my eyes. It was over pretty quickly, two minutes and something, too quickly. Maybe I'll see another someday, maybe not. Maybe I'll be able to hold on to that feeling of vastness, of space, of the extraordinary. Maybe not. When it was over, we said goodbye to the friends that we had just met. We packed up all our stuff and we hit the road back home along with everybody else. And while the traffic was bumper to bumper a lot of the way, there was a kind of patient community out there on the road back home at the gas station and the convenience store. Everybody that was in that traffic had witnessed something extraordinary. And I like to imagine that we were all a little kinder to our fellow drivers on the way home, at least for one day. I've got to wonder, does it have to take an eclipse to help us turn aside and pay attention to the universe and to one another? Can we keep our eyes open like Moses did on an otherwise ordinary day? Moses had no special filters or glasses and no NASA experts guiding him. He had no time to prepare for his encounter with the divine and no way to capture it for others as proof. He was just tending his sheep when he saw something fiery and unexpected. And when he turned aside and stayed there still long enough to really notice the miraculous and hear the voice of God, a different kind of flame lit up in him and led him all the rest of his life. I wonder, if Moses hadn't turned aside to see that burning bush, if God would have found some other way to get to him? I think so. The Bible is full of stories of God showing up when least expected and turning the ordinary into something that is ablaze with holiness. If our faith tells us anything, it's pay attention to the holy and the ordinary. Pay attention long enough to see and hear what God is doing and saying. Jesus told people to pay attention to ordinary things because in them you can see the unending love of God. Pay attention, he said, to the lilies of the field and the birds of the air and two small coins in an offering plate. Pay attention to stories of lost sheep found, of fathers running to greet wayward sons. Pay attention to the water in the font where God says you are a child of the covenant and you belong to me forever. Pay attention to the bread and the wine, to Jesus who says this, just this is my body broken for you and you are welcome at this table no matter what over and over again. Pay attention to one another, to the person beside you in worship who clasps your hand and says, the peace of Christ be with you. And when you look them in the eye and say, and also with you, you join in a great cloud of witnesses who trust that God is with them and among them and somehow brings peace through them. Listen to the still small voice inside you that says, there is something more to see here if I can just slow down and watch and listen. Pay attention long enough to hear God say, child of mine, I have something I want you to do and I will be with you. In his last words to his disciples, Jesus tells them he is with them always to the end. And he sends them out to go and make disciples together, baptizing and teaching them. And we've been at it ever since. Today, we will bless those who are heading back to school, Sunday school and regular school. Many of our church activities start up again soon and our calendars are filling up. New things are beginning, new roles and expectations, and some of you are taking on ministries in the church or maybe challenges outside these walls 
that seem hard. The kind where you look at God like Moses did and say, who am I, God, to do this hard thing? Well, like Moses and like all of us, you are a child of God, not perfect. Your journey to today has surely included some bumps along the way, some episodes you'd like to forget, either because of something you've done or something that was done to you. Your journey has surely included some unexpected blessings in unexpected places, or maybe long stretches where you wonder if you can keep on going because it's just the same sheep tending in Midian day after day. But something brought you here today, a flash of holy flame out of the corner of your eye, maybe, and you have turned aside as Moses did. So keep your eyes open. Look for the holy in the ordinary. Look for the spark of God's spirit at work and be patient. Watch, wait, and listen for God's call. There is work for the people of God to do in this world. People still in need of freedom and justice and food and shelter from storms and people in need of love and mercy and forgiveness and the grace of Jesus. People in need of wonder that lasts longer than an eclipse and community that lasts longer than one day. It's going to take patience and boldness and working together and trusting when God says, children of mine, I am with you all, and I have something I want you to do. May God bless us all, teach us patience, help us look and listen and live out love together. Amen.